people are still getting settled in so that we can make sure to have um, enough time for, um, for, any, for our presentation and for any questions that might come in. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Brett Thielen. I am the science director with the Harris Center for Conservation Education. We're sponsoring tonight's talk. Um, for those of you who might be new to the Harris Center, we're a nonprofit based in the Monadnock region of Southwest New Hampshire, where we help people fall in love with the natural world through land protection, conservation research, and education of all ages. So anyone who is local, I think will be happy to hear we've now protected more than 24,000 acres of land from development, much of which is open for hiking and birding and other recreation. We coordinate conservation research on those protected lands and throughout the region um, through a variety of really exciting projects, some of which you're gonna hear about tonight. And then at the heart of everything we do is education for all ages from babies and backpacks to residents of retirement communities and all points in between. So anyone who is local to us, if you have a young person in your life, there's a really good chance they've spent some time with a Harris Center naturalist our team works with more than 3,000 students and 30 schools every year, getting kids outside, exploring nature in their schoolyards and backyards. And we also have an incredibly rich calendar of events for the general public every year, that's you. Um, everything from guided birding outings to um, mushroom walks to Zoom presentations in this day and age like this one. Um, um, introductory business. Uh, so now it's truly my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Phil Brown, my friend and colleague. Um, any of you who've gone birding with Phil knows that he is an incredibly skilled birder and also a wonderful guide and educator as well. And he has been coordinating, um, among many things that he does, he's been coordinating hawk migration monitoring from the summit of Pacman Adnock since about 2010, the Pacman Adnock Raptor Observatory. It's one of New England's premier hawk watching sites and the Harris Center is really honored to um, help keep that site going um, in partnership with New Hampshire Audubon. And Phil has also been um, doing some other really interesting um, or participating or helping lead the Harris Center forward on some other really interesting hawk research that he's gonna share with you tonight. So. Um, we're really excited to have him here to share um, this year's exciting findings with us. And with that, um, I'm going to say, take it away, Phil. Thank you, Brett, for that warm introduction and welcome. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here speaking to this uh, wonderfully diverse geographically Paris Center audience uh, coming from all, all around the country tonight. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, as, as Brett mentioned, I've been working with Raptors through the Harris Center for several years, um, uh, and I'm pleased to be uh, moving into a new position with the Harris Center starting in January uh, as the Bird Conservation Director and Land Specialist. So hopefully there'll be even more exciting bird programs coming, uh, especially Raptor-related things that I'll talk about tonight. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, welcome all. I'm, I'm really glad to be talking about raptors, one of my favorite groups of birds. Um, talking about some of the research that's been going on that the Harris Center has been leading the way with and, and part of. Um, and uh, so first I'll just talk quickly about the Harris Center. Um, Harris Center is this organization that has a, a large land base, especially uh, around the southwestern part of New Hampshire what I'll refer to tonight at times as the super sanctuary, uh, this um, the aggregation of, of lands in both uh, fee ownership and conservation easement that Brett mentioned. Um, and so it has a, a large opportunity to influence some of the local and regional um, uh, populations of, of wildlife, um, including the raptors that we're finding. Um, so, uh, you know, rap uh, raptor monitoring, raptor management, uh, and some of the education work go hand in hand. Um, and we're excited to be able to combine these in a creative way and share this with you. Yeah. Okay. On to the next slide here. We're talking about what are raptors. First, I'll introduce the concept. I'm going to save bandwidth here. Uh, and I will mention uh, raptors are generally what I'll be talking about as birds of prey or hawks tonight. 
I'll use those terms interchangeably. But basically, I'll be talking about the Eagles, the Hawks, Falcons, and we'll include uh, other birds that, that don't have too much representation within their families, like osprey, harrier, uh, and vultures as well, which are not true hawks. Um, generally tonight, I'll be talking about the diurnal species, which are the daytime occurring species, not necessarily the night owls, however, I might mention that later. Um, so looking at a breakdown of a lot of the species I'll be talking about tonight um, and how they're doing in the Monadnock region, um, eagles, the buteos, and the occipiters, which are two families of raptors, and, uh, and the falcons on the bottom, represented by three different species. And if you've ever been up to Pac-Monadnock Raptor Observatory in Peterborough, which uh, the Harris Center uh, has now completed its 17th consecutive season of fall raptor migration monitoring, you'll probably have noticed this poster uh, at the summit, this uh, panel showing all of the commonly occurring raptors of New Hampshire, um, most of which we have been able to track during migration. In fact, I think everything on this poster was seen this year at the Hawk Watch. Um, so I'll be touching on most of these tonight um, and we'll, we'll get into it shortly. But first, an introduction to monitoring and um, the importance of, of monitoring raptors. Raptors are really useful indicators of the, the natural world. And um, they, they tend to uh, show changes in, in the environment pretty quickly. Um, they respond to these changes uh, through their populations uh, going up, going down. Uh, so a few different types of monitoring uh, that I'll mention tonight. The breeding bird survey, the breeding bird atlas, Christmas bird count, winter raptor survey, and migration monitoring. These are the traditional ways of keeping track of the migratory and, and the wintering and, and breeding raptors in our part of the world. Um, however, they all have limitations. Um, migration monitoring uh, is effective in that it's uh, standardized long-term counts. Um, so being at uh, a place like Pac-Monadnock, for example, uh, it's an excellent opportunity to see all the raptors passing by in a way that they're not uh, hiding from you like they do in the winter or in the summer. In the summer, raptors get very skulky. They stay close to their nests. Um, and uh, in the winter, you might only have a chance of seeing the open country species very easily, um, such as the, uh, the eagles and ospreys along shorelines, um, uh, falcons, which utilize cliffs. These are a little more obvious than the forest birds. And what do we have in the Monadnock region? We have a lot of forests. So finding ways to measure our populations in a heavily forested landscape is, is the challenge for us right now. Um, breeding bird surveys don't detect raptors a lot of the time because they're being very quiet around their nests. Um, these are typically conducted during the months of June and July. And at that point, uh, raptors are being fed uh, and they're staying awfully quiet. So uh, typically uh, we need a combination of these ways uh, of monitoring in order to, to really gauge what's going on with populations. And now there's a new way that I'll talk about with uh, the importance of monitoring. It's um, uh, using transmitters, uh, and I'll talk more about that, to uh, change the way that, we, that we're learning about raptors and, and keeping track of them. Uh, so moving on to Pacman Adnock, this is the, uh, the partnership with New Hampshire Audubon at Miller State Park in Peterborough, New Hampshire. Um, it's been running since 2004, um, and we are standing at a fixed point, counting all of the migrating raptors we could see in the course of a season. September 1st through November 20th has been the, the set season dates for the past 10 years. So we have a, a very consistent methodology, especially over the last decade. Uh, and that's really important, being able to um, uh, to gauge uh, everything that's moving by in a, in a set window, you can really make some, some strong assessments about what's going on with populations. And hawk watchers have made uh, considerable uh, contributions to our knowledge of raptor migration 
uh, both here in New Hampshire and across the continent. Um, and really, this is one of the most important ways that we can get information for, uh, for bird conservation and assessing raptor populations. Um, the populations of raptors are really a conspicuous gap in North American bird monitoring. Um, luckily, there is a tool that biologists are using and, and managers are using to um, assess raptor populations based on looking at a number of different hawk watch sites with consistent methodologies, um, looking at their long-term databases, um, and really putting this together in one big picture. This is the raptor population index. Um, you can see the partners on the bottom uh, that, that have founded this, this uh, innovative way to measure raptor populations. And Pacman Adnock is the one site in New Hampshire that is contributing its data to the raptor population index. Um, and it's now been part of the last two analyses. Uh, so our data are being used by biologists in order to, to determine, you know, are broadwing hawks increasing or decreasing in population or how are bald eagles doing? So these questions are, are being answered thanks to we being one of these important sites uh, along the, the Western hemisphere from all the way from Alaska and Northern Canada down to um, places in Central America, like uh, Costa Rica, Veracruz, Mexico. So we're in pretty good company. And we've, uh, we've learned a lot in these years about uh, what, what these data are telling us. And uh, each period is, is analyzed. It's a 10 year period that's analyzed. So the, the last analysis was done in 2019. It was looking at all the data from 2009 through 2019 from 76 different fall and spring count sites. And it included 1,009 trend estimates for 28 diurnal raptor species. Now we only have about 16 raptor species in our part of the country, but there are uh, over 30 in, in North America and, and Mexico. So the regions are broken up by east, west, and central flyway. Uh, so looking at the eastern uh, monitoring trends, which is you know, one of these tools that we're looking at, uh, we can see that we've, we've seen increases in bald eagle, merlin, and peregrine falcon, stable numbers of species like broad-winged hawk, turkey vulture, golden eagle, and red-shouldered hawk, and uh, a pretty big slew of decreasing species, osprey, sharp-shinned hawk, coopers, northern harrier, northern goshawk, red-tailed hawk, and American kestrel. Now, you might look at that group of decreasing species and say, oh, these are, these are some of the more familiar species that I've seen in, in my neck of the woods, uh, sharp-shinned hawks. They're, they're quite numerous, but, um, but we've actually been noticing you know, large-scale declines. Uh, so we'll get into the meat of that and try to make sense of that from a Manadnock region perspective. And the fact is raptors are faced with uh, a slew of threats, and that goes back to colonial times, really. If you think about what was going on when, um, when the colonists came and, and cleared a lot of land, that was one major landscape change. Large-scale clearing for agriculture, um, thinking about what New Hampshire looked like uh, over 100 years ago uh, and what it looks like today. The percentage of open, open land uh, to forested land has completely flip-flopped. Uh, I believe the state is now about 80% forested and it was thought to be 80% cleared uh, just over 100 years ago. So, um, so taking forested land and, and removing that cover will certainly change the distribution of how wildlife is using it. Um, so in a lot of cases, uh, raptors were being shot uh, because they were also considered a pest, um, taking people's chickens. Uh, raptors weren't even protected by law until uh, the middle of the 1900s in certain parts of, of the country. Um, the photo at the bottom right of this slide shows the, uh, just a whole pile of what looks like broad-winged hawks from this black and white photo, birds that were being shot out of the air at Hawk Mountain uh, or somewhere near that ridgeline. Hawk Mountain is the example of, of how um, you know a few people can make a big difference and a women-led 
uh, team uh, kept kept shooters away from this sanctuary. They protected a hilltop in central Pennsylvania along a, a well-known migration route for raptors. And they, um, they created the first sanctuary for birds of prey. This was back to 1934. Uh, it was an uphill battle for many decades after that. And in many parts of the world, raptors are still being shot. So it's, um, it's the direct threats such as the shooting, and, and sometimes poisoning and, and other direct impacts that raptors have to deal with, combined with the indirect threats, such as you know, how the landscape changes, um, forest cover, development of energy is a big one, introduced species, climate change is looking like a pretty major uh, implication in what's going on with, with various species of raptors, especially in the West. Uh, because of large scale changes in the climate. Um, more severe storms are having impacts as well. So plenty for raptors to be dealing with. Um, and, and we, uh, New Hampshire especially has a, you know, being a heavily forested state now, we harbor a large responsibility as a population source for predominantly the forested raptor species which have become less common in places uh, like the South and the Mid-Atlantic where development is, is so rampant. Um, so we have uh, a large responsibility to species like Northern goshawk, red-shouldered hawk, and certainly broadwing hawk from what we're learning. We'll get more into that. So a quick look at the state list of endangered, threatened, and special concern species. There are uh, quite a few raptor species on this list. Um, looking at uh, the number of, of vertebrate wildlife on this list, it makes up a, you know, a, a fairly large percentage. We still have two endangered species, although one no longer nests in New Hampshire. The golden eagle has been extirpated since 1956 as a breeding bird. Um, why it's on the list still, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but um, sometimes these state and federal listings take a long time for uh, for list changes and removals. Northern Harrier is the other one uh, that is now listed as state endangered. Uh, we still have state threatened peregrine falcons. They used to be state endangered. They used to be federally endangered, but that's a, a large success story that I'll talk about later. And special concern, bald eagle. Um, only decades ago, bald eagle was also listed federally as endangered and then threatened and then removed from both of those on the federal list. Now bumped all the way down to special concern as the eagles have resurged in a big way. Um, American kestrel, however, species that 50 or 60 years ago, nobody would have thought would be on a special concern list. They don't have the opportunities they used to in our landscape. And that's, uh, that's a story that's that's going on in, in a lot of the country as well. All right, we'll take a quick snapshot at the migration count. And this is the first look that you're all gonna get at the, the final tally for 2021 from Pacman Adnock uh, and species by species comparing the, the mean or average count to the 2021 count. Um, there are a few noticeable trends here. Um, and, and I'll be using the raptor data here tonight because this is what what we really have in the Monadnock region to help tell this story. Um, it's certainly not the it's not the gospel here. It's um it has its limitations. Migration counting is uh, gathering information about birds that aren't necessarily in the landscape that we are in the breeding season. So these are capturing birds from Canada and Maine, places to the north and east, typically that are flying past us, but also probably telling, uh, in some cases, a similar story to what's going on in our immediate landscape. Um, so generally we see broadwing hawks making up about 75 to 80% of the count year to year. Um, and the other species that we see a good number of is sharp shinned hawks. So those two are, are highlighted in the mean column. Um, on the, uh, the column on the right, 2021, the species showing um, those blue numbers, um, these, are, these are counts that are well above the average. So um, 
So turkey vultures, for example, um, really off the charts this year. Um, we've never seen numbers like that before, or even close to it. Bald eagles continue their long climb, red shoulder hawks doing well, peregrine falcons, but we've, we've seen declines as well with osprey, northern goshawk, and uh, broadwing talk, and some of those have been sustained year to year. So now that we covered some of the, the basics, the threats, and the, the really the statewide picture, I wanted to jump into the species, and from here we'll get into some of the stories too and some of the, the Harris Center's work. Um, so I'll go species by species, turkey vulture. Um, so I prepared a, a series of graphs here from the raptor population index on the bottom left, showing percentage changes over the year, um, year to year, uh, of birds that we've tallied at uh, Pacman Adnock Raptor Observatory. Um, the, the top graph shows year by year the actual number for that species. Um, so you'll see some, some big increases, for example, in the turkey vulture population. And uh, the general increase percentage on the bottom right. So we know turkey vultures, in this case, are increasing at 8.33% per year. That was according to the last analysis in 2019. So now we have two more years of data that will be analyzed probably in, in the coming year, I'm guessing, will be the next analysis. Uh, so this will be something I'll show for each species. But uh, So take this with a grain of salt. We know that turkey vultures are increasing as a migrant. Um, we don't know enough about raptors in breeding season in New Hampshire, with the, with a few exceptions of the birds that have been studied for a long time, the eagle, peregrine, osprey, those three we have a pretty good sense of. But what I can tell you about turkey vultures is that the first confirmed turkey vulture nest was right in the Harris Center's super sanctuary landscape. This is a photo of Willard Pond in uh, Antrim uh, and showing Bald Mountain on the upper right. Um, so going back to 1981, the first turkey vultures were confirmed nesting. And this is a success story from the south, the species that invaded from the south and um, perhaps uh, you know, for the first time really coming into this landscape in, in large numbers just in recent decades. Um, their increases to the north have continued well into Canada, all across New Hampshire now as a breeding bird. Um, very common, really wherever you go during, during the summer season. Um, at this point in the season, turkey vultures have migrated out to the south and might be hanging on in just one or two roost locations in southern New Hampshire but that's really as far north as they'll go in a, in a New England winter. Um, but so interesting facts that Harris Center has a connection to this landscape where the first vultures were. Um, so the bird on the right, uh, you'll recognize perhaps as the turkey vulture with its um, featherless head, um, resembles a turkey in body size and, and that bald headed appearance, a little bit of a, a hooked bill for prying apart uh, dead animals. That's uh, the only thing it, it feeds on. Um, so these are not raptors. They don't have the killing talons. But the bird on the left is a species that was just tallied for the first time at Pacman Adnock this fall, this October. We tallied our first two black vultures, which might be the next species from the south that colonizes the state. Uh, perhaps um, maybe the next species that we'll find as a nesting bird. Right now, it hasn't been confirmed nesting, but it's nesting in Western Massachusetts, the species, and it seems like uh, a bird that's just gonna keep on continuing its, its push north. They tend to be a little hardier in some ways, a little more aggressive, I should say, than, than turkey vultures, although smaller and, uh, and you know, slightly different in appearance. They, uh, they'll probably keep up with, with turkey vultures pretty effectively. Um, so keep an eye out for these birds as we move ahead. Um, I know Hawk Mountain is interested in uh, finding records of black vultures. So we're always uh, trying to get the message out there to, to everybody to report their birds in, in ways where um, the greater science world can make use of, of that data. So uh, in this case, ebird.org is a great location to uh, set up an account and report your bird sightings. 
you can be sure that if you submit something through eBird, it will get the attention of, um, of a biologist, especially if it's a species like black vulture. Thank you, Brett, for posting that. I won't dwell too much on that species, except to say, keep your eyes out. Um, and now, yeah, for the next four species, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of uh, this, these species and their statewide monitoring by New Hampshire Audubon and, and um, the state of New Hampshire. So perhaps some of you got to see Chris Martin's talk recently. Oh, let me answer Trisha's question first. Um, warming climate, it's, uh, it's certainly a possibility. It does seem like the, the expansion of vultures have, uh, did start um, decades ago, more than, more than just in recent years. So even steadily, um, steadily north into New Jersey and New York, the black vultures weren't even in uh, the mid-Atlantic states uh, in, in a large way until the 1980s and 1990s. So they have been moving north, uh, perhaps um, the, the highway system is thought to be one of the early ways of transporting turkey vultures north. Um, so going back many decades, that process probably got started. And then landfills, large landfills along the East Coast have also been a food source for vultures along the way. Um, so yeah, really isolating those factors, it's, it's hard to determine exactly what, and oftentimes it does seem like there are multiple reasons for population changes, but it all takes uh, a lot more research, <laughs> is what I'll say. So yeah, the next four species, uh, I'll mention osprey first. Um, uh, Chris Martin was talking about this recently at a presentation through the Harris Center. Um, ospreys really only started breeding again after uh, the impacts of DDT, uh, which was a chemical that uh, thinned the eggshells of many raptor species, they, they really only came back in the 70s in northern New Hampshire. They were pretty much gone from the state, um, so they began to recolonize um, the Lake Umbagog area. These are strictly fish-eating birds, otherwise known as the fish hawk. Lake Umbagog, pictured here. Um, is, uh, is a wonderfully large and diverse lake with lots of shallow marshes, great fish populations, um, plenty of habitat for, uh, for species like ospreys, eagles, loons, really all the wetland loving birds. Um, so that was the stronghold for, for both ospreys and bald eagles. Um, and I'll mention those later. Um, so ospreys expanded in the 1990s into the Great Bay Area. Um, and have been increasing since then. In 2005, the first pair nested in southwestern New Hampshire. So it took that long after DDT, which was banned in the early 70s, uh, for those, those impacts to, to really uh, be able to, to get back to where they were in southwestern New Hampshire before DDT. Now, Chris thinks that there are about 175 pair of ospreys statewide. Um, and we only confirmed our first super sanctuary breeder in 2020, um, right here in Hancock. So plenty of room for growth. Um, the map here shows some, uh, this shows some declines in the migratory population, as well as some stable blue dots. So many declining numbers in the Eastern Flyway, especially in inland sites. Um, so we know ospreys are, are struggling and there might be some reasons for that that have to do with their, their larger fish loving cousin, the bald eagle. Um, ospreys are fairly adaptable though, and they will nest in close proximity to each other in the right habitat. So some of these marshy sites, the Chesapeake Bay, Cape Cod, Florida, has a lot of places with, uh, with good habitat and fish populations. Ospreys will be pretty thick in, in those areas. But when you do get a bald eagle in the area, that's when the ospreys seem to have trouble competing. They might be facing uh, indirect impacts like uh, the eagles competing for, uh, for food, for the same fish populations, but oftentimes it's pretty direct impacts where eagles have been implicated as uh, preying on osprey chicks, um, also driving them out, just harassing them endlessly taking over their stick nests uh, at the edge of a marsh, at the edge of a lake. 
and lately even in places that are um, birds that have been nesting on on poles and man-made structures even bald eagles will will get into those areas and take over however ospreys are still hanging on and about half their population in the state now is using these man-made structures such as uh, electric lines um, and the other half probably using uh, places like um, um, beaver swamps, um, big stick nests that they build. This one built right on top of a great blue heron nest. You can see the finer sticks below. I know because I was monitoring this site um, between 2019 and 2020, and this nest went up in that time when the birds came back in 2020. So this is the Hancock nest. It's a little bit of a grainy shot, but you can see two adults with the with the brown stripe going through the head um, sitting on their nest so that's a, a huge structure a huge nest and they're often built in these beaver swamps in trees that are that are quite on their last legs so to speak um, so these nests don't last a long time and they're they're massive structures so they fall in with ice and snow loading during the winter a lot of the time very ephemeral Whereas bald eagles um, usually pick a little bit more of a solid structure to place their nest and um, come back to it year after year for a long time, um, as do many forest nesting species. Um, there is a, a great website, uh, Project Osprey Net, that's run by the New Hampshire Science Center, uh, Squam Lake Science Center. Um, and through the work, of uh, Ian McLeod and Rob Beauregard, an osprey researcher. Um, they have teamed up to, to affix satellite transmitters to many of the lakes region of New Hampshire's uh, breeding osprey pairs. So they've climbed the nesting poles or trees and been able to uh, set traps and um, uh, get adult ospreys tracked. So satellite transmitters are giving us great information about Osprey movements. We've learned a lot in in the last couple of decades about ospreys thanks to the transmitter technology, uh, such as how long they could fly over the ocean without landing. 82 hours over the ocean in this case for this bird from uh, the tip of uh, eastern Newfoundland to South Carolina. Um, apparently this bird had to dodge a storm in the upper right quadrant here where that that big sweeping east to west path takes it. Uh, this is a, a southbound migrant from um, in the fall. Uh, so we're learning a lot about just how they, they can survive, how they avoid storms, how they can uh, you know, fly right into the storms and often perish too. Um, that's, that's happening without landing indeed. So um, these birds are, are pretty amazing. Um, and it, it calls to the attention some of the impacts like climate change with, with more severe hurricanes, that often happens right as the ospreys are heading south over the Atlantic in mid-September. Um, I don't think they sleep as they're migrating. Um, okay, bald eagle. Uh, a big success story. Bald eagles have been literally going off the charts in almost every category breeding records uh, after after 40 years without bald eagles um, because of DDT thinning their eggshells um, a bald eagle nest was found in 1989 on Lake Umbagog in the same tree 40 years later uh, where they where that species last nested um, almost couldn't have been the same eagle I mean almost impossible for an eagle to live that long but in the same tree in the middle of the marsh, a bald eagle took up residence. And since then, um, the population has been recolonize, recolonizing the state. Uh, they used to be fairly common uh, pre-DDT um, pre era. So um, for the last 40 years, New Hampshire Audubon has been uh, tracking the eagles during a midwinter national eagle count in New Hampshire. and um, We've seen uh, numbers going up from, from fewer than five to now 100 birds were, was hit in 2020. Um, I believe that was the last year of this census. 
realizing, yep, I think eagles are doing okay. So that's eagles that are sticking around in the winter. Now, granted, some of them do migrate out, and we've, we've seen that here with our numbers too, lots of eagles migrating in the last few years. Um, but even in, in breeding season and wintering season, we're seeing about 100 eagles throughout New Hampshire. Many of the adults do stay over, over the winter and tend to their nests. Um, there are now close to 70 active nests in the state, and that's up from six or seven in, uh, in 2005, I wanna say. This is another great way of keeping track of individual birds through the use of excellent photography, tracking bands. If you could read a band, you have great information about eagles. Um, here's a map showing statewide of breeding eagle territories. There are about five pairs in the, the Manadnock Super Sanctuary region here um, without uh, driving too far from the Harris Center. And uh, here's the pair from Lake Nubanusit. I took a peek at uh, the, the two current birds that were there today, uh, November 30th. There were two eagles this morning chasing away a youngster that seemed to carry on because it was too close to the nesting territory. All right, I'm going to move a little quicker here. Jump into Northern Harriers, state endangered bird. It's declining at hawk watches. Uh, it's declining as a breeding bird. Um, the Harriers have really been declining since the 1930s as the forests have started to regrow and regenerate. Um, the last three years, including well, the next year, 2022, will be the third year of um, a statewide assessment that New Hampshire Audubon is spearheading, um, looking for breeding Harriers. Um, the top number from the past three years was six pair of Harrier. And they're pretty much all in the northern part of Coas County, uh, north of the White Mountains. The same story is being told across the, the landscape with Harriers. They're declining in a lot of places as well. And um, this is a couple of field biologists here uh, you might recognize from uh, the, the Hawk Watch. Uh, Levi and Katrina are the, the two um, Harrier biologists for the last couple of years. So they spend all summer tromping around trying to track down Harriers nesting, and they've been lucky enough to see a few nests as well. Uh, these raptors will breed in places like the brushy area behind where they're standing. Uh, that is the site of one of the nests. So adjacent to large, expansive fields, rolling hills, landscapes that, that we don't have in the rest of the state. Um, large enough wetlands in proximity to large grasslands. So they're hanging on just by a thread, um, but there's still uncertainty about their management needs. And it seems like predation, ground predation may be a threat, as well as habitat or food limitations that we don't know about yet. Peregrine falcons, another success story, bounced back from DDT, uh, was a federally endangered bird. They were really almost completely wiped out and had to be reintroduced in a way um, through these hacking towers. Um, so peregrines have reclaimed their sites on some of the cliff nests in Northern New Hampshire, some of the historic cliff nests in the White Mountains. Um, so most of them are cliff nesting birds. However, there are still some peregrines or there are, are now some peregrines that are nesting on artificial structures like bridges, towers, um, uh, the Hinsdale, um, uh, the Burnin nuclear power plant had a pair until the, the tower was taken down a couple of years ago. Now about 25 pairs in New Hampshire. And they always put on a great show. These are fascinating and exciting birds to watch. The productivity has gone way up since the 1980s. Um, and now I'll get into some of the more obscure species that we don't know too much about. And we realize we, we have a, a need for uh, for this data. Uh, there's a big data gap in what we know about forest nesting raptors, and this is one of them, among the most secretive, in fact. The sharp-shinned hawk is a small bird, a little bit bigger than a blue jay or a robin, um, but uh, a predator of your back backyard songbirds, nonetheless. Uh, fairly common in migration, and um, even in the winter on Christmas bird counts, but we're noticing, along with other hawk watch sites all across the country, that sharp-shinned hawks are, are declining pretty rapidly. 
um, at a pretty steady pace. In some places that looks like a, a decrease by several thousand birds a year in a season. So that's, that's pretty big numbers. Um, their nesting appears to be scattered around New Hampshire, most heavily concentrated in Northern New Hampshire from what we know from the last breeding bird atlas, which was a all boots on the ground effort, getting out in the woods and looking at every part of the state, confirming nests and feeding, confirming breeding for many species of birds. Um, so at that point, sharp and hawk nests were found, but we haven't had a statewide breeding bird atlas in over 25 years now. Uh, so that's a big uh, need for, for data on all species, but um, on raptor nesting, we really have no idea if we've seen increases or decreases, um, only incidental finds in this case. Um, however, I, even though we don't have the same forest type as Northern New Hampshire, we do have areas around the super sanctuary, uh, some, some of the higher hills, which are still spruce dominated. This may be a good place to start looking for sharp shinned nests. Um, finding them is another story. I think they'd be pretty well tucked away, but would likely involve some sort of playback or, or trying to um, get to these places really early, listening for calls. So not an easy survey, but it's calling out for a, a capable graduate student project. Cooper's hawk is um, uh, a larger cousin of the sharp shinned hawk and historically one of the most common raptors in the state. They declined due to DDT in, in a big number between the 50s and the 80s. They were listed at that point as state threatened, um, still considered rare during the 1994 state atlas. Uh, however, now it seems like the Cooper's hawk population has stabilized. They've made a strong recovery. Um, the reason for their declines here that you're seeing on the on the migration map, uh, migration page, uh, is likely due to the Cooper's hawk becoming a little less migratory in general, maybe tolerating winter conditions better. Maybe that's climate change related. Um, that's certainly one of the leading thoughts about why they're sticking around, but also they do well with urbanization. So these birds uh, make good use of your city pigeons or um, uh, farm uh, starlings that are flying around in large flocks on agricultural areas. We may start to see more of their nests. Um, during the, the work I was doing this past summer, I came across two Cooper's hawk nests in the Monadnock region, um, just by chance looking for broad-winged hawk nests. They tend to nest in pretty similar areas. It just became a matter of just figuring out who was sitting on those nests. And it took me a few visits, but finally saw that long tail sticking out of one and a long banded tail gave it away as a Cooper's hawk. They also have competed with the larger Northern goshawk. Um, and that was cited as another reason for their scarcity in recent years, but um, Northern goshawks may now be declining. So we may start to see more Cooper's hawks take over again. And the Northern goshawk talking about this uh, ferocious large exhibitor. Uh, this bird is known as uh, a real terrorizer of, of anybody near its nests. Um, this is a big bird, almost the size of a red-tailed hawk, standing about 20 inches tall. They were historically a pretty rare resident of the northern forests. Um, they at some point expanded their breeding range south in, uh, from Canada into northern U.S. and uh, into, um, into 1980. Um, Reforestation was a big part of that. At some point, they started to decline. Um, there is a study of goshawks in central New Hampshire that's being led by um, biologists Chris Costello and Mariko Yamasaki. Um, and apparently there's a, a recent effort to expand the study to a statewide initiative. So this is something where the Monadnock region may have an opportunity to contribute some, some knowledge and data. Um, each summer we hear of several goshawk nests in the area and it's, you know, you, you know about it if you're near one um, and the adults are flying around, especially the larger females, they come in uh, shrieking, cack, 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 this large, this, this large bird flying at you and, you know, the Doppler effect of its call getting closer and louder. Um, it's, it's pretty terrifying. I've had it happen a few times. So um, people end up reporting this 
um, and hopefully staying away at that point because there's no good in going back until they're done breeding. Um, but it's exciting if, if uh, when we do learn of goshawk nests, um, we're still trying to learn about how to best manage forests for raptor species, for breeding raptors. But we know that northern goshawks typically like um, larger forests, so medium to larger sized trees, including old growth forests, um, areas that are very open in the understory and generally around here conifer dominated. We've learned from researchers in states south of us that um, they're starting to disappear from the southern part of their range in breeding season. They're still seemingly doing okay around the Great Lakes and in the northern part of the range, but Virginia, Maryland, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania have shown major declines, uh, almost disappearing completely from a long-term uh, monitoring project that's been going on there for a couple of decades. So some alarming trends that might be tied to increased development pressures, could be tied to climate change, forest change, the prey base. Um, goshawks are a species that forages on larger mammals. So um, snowshoe hares in the north are important to them. And they're often tied to cycles in the hare population. So we'll see, presumably we'll see these spike years that you're seeing on the top graph here. Uh, following years of high rabbit populations. At least that's the theory uh, from looking at other numbers from uh, Midwestern hawk watches where they see more goshawks than we do. So an interesting species, um, one that uh, despite its aggressive nature, it, it warrants uh, our protection. And um, if, if anybody knows about goshawk nests, I'd be really interested in learning about them. Um, I'll provide my email address at the end of the talk. Get on to red-shouldered hawk, uh, a less common beauty o uh, than, than the familiar red-tailed hawk or broadwing hawk. And they're historically here at the northern edge of their range, typically south of the White Mountains. Uh, but they've been declining, especially from southern and coastal areas. And that is likely due to development pressures. They've been uh, retracting their range from areas that have had heavy development in states to the south of us. Um, however, we still might have a pretty decent population in the, uh, the undeveloped portions of southwestern New Hampshire. Um, I came across a nest this summer near the Harris Center. Uh, they favor these, um, you know, here's a nice up close of a red-shouldered. They're a really attractive um, colorful species. And they, they like this kind of habitat. So beaver swamps, wetlands, um, edges, but typically nesting in, in deciduous trees around areas that have wetland habitat. Um, yeah, Trisha has a question about um, logging going on in, a, in one particular area of New Hampshire and wondering if this has impact on the raptors. But yeah, undoubtedly, um, any sort of logging will will change up the landscape a little bit. There are some ways to mitigate your impact on raptors. And the most important thing is to try to avoid the nesting season. Uh, so logging during nesting season, which for goshawks actually starts in March. So it's a very early nesting season. Typically it, it aligns well with mud season in this part of the world. And that's generally not a time when people are, are doing a lot of logging, uh, thankfully, but Nesting season does extend for many of these raptor species until June, June and July. So by then, logging is, is up and running and, and in full force. Um, certainly does have, have impacts. Um, and yeah, certainly um, there are other combinations of, of appropriate logging for, for raptors and then certain tactics that you'll want to avoid too. Um, yeah, that's, that's a bigger question, but I appreciate the question there. Yeah, let me jump into one here that I'd like to spend a little bit of time on, the broad-winged hawk, um, a species that we see the most of during hawk watching season in the fall, um, and the most by large numbers. You don't typically see raptors in flocks, but every fall uh, during migration season over our ridge tops and uh, the ridge lines of, along the Appalachian chain, we'll see hundreds or sometimes even thousands in a day of broad-winged hawks gathering together in large numbers. So it's, it's quite a spectacle. 
um, their entire population, uh, they're a complete migrant. So broad-winged hawks nest in this band across southern Canada into the eastern U.S. Um, their breeding range in the summer, uh, basically arriving in our part of the world in April and departing in September. Uh, so they spend half the year in the eastern U.S. and southern Canada, and they clear out completely and uh, spill into Central America and northern uh, parts of South America. That's their wintering range. So um, a complete migrant in that way. And um, this summer, or uh, the Harris Center launched a new partnership with Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Um, uh, we, we officially launched it in 2020, but due to the COVID year, we didn't have a field season uh, to do the, the nest monitoring and, and the tagging. But this year, we sent out 15 volunteers and staff, and uh, we were successful in finding and monitoring nine different broadwing hawk nests in the Monadnock region, half of those located on Harris Center lands. Um, it took countless hours and several weeks to line up enough active nests. Uh, and then in late June, we deployed a crew, a trapping crew. Uh, so, you know, here's the search image. You're looking for a big stick nest with a broadwing hawk in it. There's the adult sitting there. Um, later in the summer, if you're lucky, your eggs will hatch. And uh, the photo on the left here shows chicks maybe a, a week to two old, and then the one on the right, much closer to fledging in the four week range. So we worked with biologists from Hawk Mountain to affix satellite and cellular transmitters on three adult birds, on um, nests, uh, two, of, two of them are on Harris Center lands. Um, and now we're getting real time data showing how these birds are moving and where they're wintering. Um, this image here is, uh, is not a researcher playing video games, but essentially uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, she's, this is Rebecca McCabe set up in, uh, in a little camouflage tent with um, a great horned owl decoy out here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'm circling it there. Uh, the owl has a, they have a speaker set up in this tent. The speaker is playing, broadcasting great horned owl calls. And Rebecca is moving this joystick here and the head of the owl is moving around. The wings are going out. This is a, this was a real great horned owl that's been uh, taxidermied for these purposes. And then there's a mist net that you can't see set up between uh, the owl and where the hawk is, presumably. Um, so the hawk comes in. It's pretty fascinating once it happens. It happens immediately and uh, not all the time, but once the hawk hits the net, it's just chaos. Everybody knows what they have to do. So this is Dr. Lori Goodrich. She's the lead uh, conservation biologist at Hawk Mountain and the head of this crew. So she and I here are processing this bird, putting bands on the bird. So both a um, uh, color band, um, she's taking measurements of the tarsus, the leg length, the wing length, uh, bill length, blood samples, checking eye color. Uh, they got a feather sample. Um, so lots of interesting information being learned just from the trapping process. And then the fun part comes, they uh, have to tie this little backpack transmitter, which is either reliant on um, a cellular signal or satellite tracking. Um, and this uh, gets affixed to the back of the bird uh, in a way that's snug right around its wings in a way where it doesn't impact the bird's ability to catch food and survive. So, um, so Rebecca here is harnessing this backpack, which weighs less than 10% of the weight of the bird. So it's calculated in a way that is not going to impact the bird. Um, I believe here, uh, this is Brett's photo. So this would be, um, what bird was this, Brett? Do you remember? That was Monadnock. We Monadnock, okay. Named Monadnock. From Dublin. Yes, thank from you. Dublin. Yep. So this is a female uh, named Monadnock. So females are larger than males. And I think here I'm holding a male uh, from, uh, actually, no, this is, this is a female too. This is Thelma from uh, Willard Pond Road area. Um, and here, uh, yeah, I don't know if that's the same bird that might be. And that has a, a transmitter on the back, that tag gets cut off. 
but that's what it looks like when it's up there. And that's a solar panel that's charging the transmitter signal. So sometimes we go long stretches without getting a signal. This bird, Thelma, we thought, we thought it was a goner for many months. And then suddenly Thelma was up in the air above the forest, uh, away from her nest and sending us signals um, on where she was. Uh, volunteer Rich Frechette here is holding Hiroshi from, uh, I'm sorry, holding Harris from the Hiroshi property in uh, the Dublin Harrisville area. And um, and we get these cool maps showing how these birds are moving. Um, the blue represents that bird Hiroshi that we were just looking at. This is a male bird during the breeding season. Um, it's covering several kilometers between in this case, Dublin Lake here on Route 101 um, and almost out to Route 202. The female bird that was that we tagged on the left staying much closer to its nest. This is Monadnock. Um, and it was staying within one or two kilometers from that nest at all times during the breeding season until those young were, were out on their own. And this is what we're looking at right now. This is uh, an image from uh, recent days. Um, as of mid-November, there are seven birds that the crew affixed transmitters to from Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and the three that we have from New Hampshire. Um, so our bird here, Monadnock, seems to be the one that made it the furthest with, with the signal anyway. We know at this point, the birds get into dense Amazon basin forests and start to, um, not transmit, not, not get a solar charge because they're in such a shaded area for a while. So come uh, spring, I expect we'll start to see this whole map show up again. And uh, the map is live. I think, um, I think Greg will post something about that. So I'll jump ahead. I realize it's 6.30 now. I'm going a little bit over as I tend to do when I talk about hawks. So sorry about that, uh, but I'll, I'll fly through the last few here. Red-tailed hawks declining as a as a migratory bird in our area. Um, however, they seem to be doing pretty well at this point. Um, we're not concerned about red tails. They're well adapted to um, human areas. Yeah, your guess is as good as mine here as to what this is. Um, my, my thought was a young gull, but it also has quite falcon-shaped wings. I, I photographed this bird in downtown Manchester a bunch of years ago. So I'm not sure what it was. Golden Eagles, we have a small population coming from Quebec and Labrador, passing through the Manadnock region. Uh, our biologist saw 11 this year at Pac Manadnock this fall, um, but we're not gonna focus on them since they don't breed in this area. Merlins have recolonized areas where they um, had been extirpated for a long time as a breeding bird. But in 1994, the first breeding pair showed up in Northern New Hampshire. Now they're spread across the entire state and all the way down into New York and New Jersey. Um, so they're reclaiming pre-colonial range, presumably, as the forests returned. And they adapt really well to um, urbanized landscapes. American kestrel is a species that we're, we're pretty excited about learning more about. Um, we know what we can do to increase kestrel populations. We know they've been limited in recent years. Their declines are tied to a number of things, including uh, forest change, um, you know, forest regeneration, really. Um, they were common in open landscapes with a lot of smaller agricultural areas. Um, and um, you know, utilizing landscapes like this cattle farm, um, overgrown barns, actually nesting in old buildings or in silos is a pretty common thing. Um, uh, flicker or pileated woodpecker holes in telephone poles make a pretty good uh, nesting hole for a kestrel, as do nest boxes. And that's where we think there's a, there's a difference to be made. Um, nest box studies in New Hampshire have shown that their productivity is diminishing um, and they're down uh, considerably using only a handful of boxes that have been installed and maintained. Um, so their, their overall population is dropping, and that's, that's reason to, to do something for kestrels. So part of, part of what we're going to be looking at in the coming year is whether the Harris Center might be able to launch a, a kestrel nest box program and a community science 
elements there, um, tie it into uh, uh, maybe another graduate student research project. Um, we have we have big hopes for what we can do to uh, to make a difference for kestrels in this landscape. Um, they're declining regionally, and um, all that red on this map on the right shows declines in their in their range. Only a few increases there in green. So I'm almost at the end here, and I wanted to just turn attention very briefly here to the owls. The uh, often nocturnal birds, but not always nocturnal birds. Um, so uh, saw-wet owl is a species that we've learned a lot about through um, projects in adjacent states. Um, there, there are some efforts that, are, uh, that have been banding saw-wet owls now for a number of years. Um, in the Monadnock region, um, there was a project that was going on for a couple of years and we realized, oh, they're, they're here too in pretty big numbers. This is a, a usually very scarce owl that we rarely see and uh, you know even rarely hear. Uh, but they're they're migrating through every fall. They're probably wintering in our area in some levels, and they're certainly breeding in our area as well. Um, uh, the Harris Center easement had a a pair nesting in a box uh, several years ago that I was lucky enough to see. Um, so. Another species that we'll be looking closely at in the coming year to see if the Harris Center might be uh, one of these locations where we can be learning about solid owls uh, in our region and in the state. So with that, I realize I'm a few minutes over here, um, just a, a teaser on nighthawks too. Um, stay tuned for more information about monitoring nighthawks next year, something that we're, uh, even though they're not true hawks, I wanted to throw that in there because they often get confused as hawks. Um, and now I'll I'll take some questions if anybody has them. There was one question that I will um, that I think you didn't answer yet, and someone was asking about that osprey migration and whether they are feeding while they're moving over water or they're just flying. Oh, good question. Well, knowing ospreys, I believe they they don't feed while they're flying. Um, I believe they have to perch somewhere and rip apart their prey. So yeah, that's that's a long, exhausting trip without eating. Yeah, no kidding. Well, thank you so much, Phil. We I think I think we answered all the questions and we we are a little over on time, but I did put in the chat um, we are having a Sawwet Owl um, researcher speaking via Zoom in January, someone from the North Branch Nature Center. So um, keep an eye out for that if, if tiny owls um, pique your interest and, and hopefully more to come up from that too. Um, but thank you so much, Phil. And I put Phil's email in the chat as well. So if there's any follow-up questions that folks have, you can email him at brown at harriscenter.org. And, um, Hopefully we will see some of you on Thursday for learning about other winter birds, or our, maybe I should say winter birds of the Monadnock region, which may include some raptors and may include some other birds as well. So thanks everyone. And um, thank you we'll for see joining you everybody. Time.